So welcome to everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining this webinar about the Locally un Unlocking Culture Through Inclusive Access Lucia call. This call will specifically cover information for potential applicants and will enable the opportunity for us to hold a question and answer session. It's really great to see how much interest this program has attracted and we're really grateful for your time today. And thank you to everybody who submitted questions in advance. I'm going to pass over to Emily Bultitude, who will cover some housekeeping items. Hi there. Thanks so much, Lucy. And um, just to echo Lucy, it's really exciting to see the interest levels in the programme so far. So thank you for, uh, for attending. Um, I'm going to take us through some housekeeping um, pointers firstly. So if we could move on a slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so first, I've just seen a question in the chat, actually, and just to confirm, we will indeed be recording this webinar. Um, it's obviously to enable people who aren't here today to, to catch up. Um, but also, if there's anything that you want to re-listen to, that will obviously be available. We're going to share it on our UKRI Funding Finder website. Um, I'll share the link for that as well. Um, just to say that closed captions have been enabled by the um, host team here for this webinar. So if you do need uh, to, to access these, please turn them on uh, by using, um, I'm told there's a, you can select the, the show captions um, setting. You can then choose your language and then confirm it. And I think you just then need to, to select save. Um, Alice, I wonder if there's a way of putting that in the chat. Um, there is a, a link if anyone's having trouble with that. Please don't hesitate to use the chat function for any, any questions or um, any issues with audio, audio et cetera, things like that. Um, just to note, unfortunately, we are not able to enable audio for everybody today. We've got, um, we're really excited to see the numbers today um, because it's such a large number of um, expected attendees. Uh, we're gonna keep it quite clean and, um, and simply have hosts and um, panel members having their audio on. Obviously, if you can't hear us at any stage, please don't hesitate to put something in the chat. You can send us an email separately, um, whatever works, but do let us know if there's any trouble with audio for you. Can I have the next slide, please, on housekeeping? Thank you. Um, just to be clear, we're aiming to answer all the questions that have been submitted in advance of today. Uh, thank you so much to all of you who put things um, in your webinar registration. Um, if there are any further questions that come through today, please by all means use the Zoom chat function. What we'll be doing is we're gonna be monitoring, monitoring it really closely um, and we're gonna be adding any questions that come through on there into a FAQ document, which will be, uh, we're, we're busily compiling already, but we'll also be um, sharing after the webinar for everybody to access there. And finally, um, we're gonna be sharing an email address at the end of this um, session. So please do feel free to contact us if you've got any further inquiries or if anything is unclear or if you've, um, you've got any thoughts or comments or um, anything that you'd like us to know about afterwards. Um, and that includes obviously any um, uh, very specific queries relating directly to your specific application. We'd love to hear from you. Um, I'm gonna take us through the agenda now. Um, we've got a really exciting agenda here. If I can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So welcome and housekeeping, obviously we're on that now. Um, I'm about to hand over to Dr. Jaideep Gupte, um, who is our Director of Research, Strategy and Innovation here at the AHRC. And he's gonna give us a bit of a strategic overview of how the Lucia program will meet AHRC and UKRI's vision. We'll then hand over uh, or back, hand back, I guess, to, to James and to me, James Phillips and I. Um, we work together on the AHRC Cities and Urban Environments portfolio. Um, and we're going to give a bit of an overview of sort of key information that's, um, that's within the call. We'll then hand over to our colleague, Mike Collins, who is head of our public engagement team here at the AHRC. And he's going to give a bit of an overview of um, the expectations for all the networks that will be funded through the programme from a public engagement point of view. Um, and then we're delighted to say we've got Professor Robert McIntosh and Dr. Dong Lin here, who both work within the EDI caucus, um, funded by UKRI and the British Academy. They're going to give us a bit of an introduction to the work of the EDI caucus and also how the Lucia programme um, is engaging with this at the moment. We're going to then go into a time of Q&A. So um, we're going to look at all the questions that have been sent in. Um, and Lucy Hackett will be hosting this um, with me and James and Mike and Tom Yates from our operations team um, looking to, to form the panel of answers. Um, and then we'll be wrapping up. Um, and as I say, we'll be sharing sort of uh, key contacts and things right at the end. So, but without further ado, can I hand over to Do Dr. Jaideep Gupte? Thank you. Thank you, Emily, so much. And thank you, Lucy. Well, good afternoon, 
everyone. I'm Jaideep Gupte. I'm the Director of Research, Strategy and Innovation at the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Um, thank you so much for being here today. It is really an honor to welcome you as prospective applicants to the this year program. Um, you know, this, in our view, is really a groundbreaking opportunity in many ways for researchers, for community leaders, policymakers uh, to come together in a new and transformative way uh, and shape a future that genuinely reflects um, voices and experiences of those at the heart uh, of our communities. And fundamentally, I think Lucia offers something quite unique in that we're here to shift the power dynamics around who has access to knowledge at that local level. Um, so from the, we've, we've got a slide for you, uh, Emily, Lucy, if you can move, thank you. Um, so from the slide, um, you know, you can see one of the, the most exciting things uh, we've um, um, thought through uh, about the this year program is its focus on listening to and empowering voices that have often been left out, uh, whether it's women, ethnic minorities, or other marginalized groups. Um, the program is about preventing the marginalization that can occur when those voices are, are ignored. And it's about making sure that community-led agencies are the heart of our research efforts, um, because real change only happens when communities are not just included, but empowered uh, to take control of their of their own futures. Uh, so a central goal of the Lucia program is to foster a culture of co-created policy design. Uh, we want to move away from the old model where policy is imposed from the top down um, and instead, um, imagine a framework where communities, researchers, policymakers collaborate uh, at every stage of the process. Um, when policies, uh, in our view, are co-designed in this way, they reflect um, the lived experience, the needs, as well as the aspirations of people that they're meant to serve. And this not only makes those policies more effective, um, but ensures that they are just uh, and equitable and address the root causes of, of inequality rather than just the symptoms. So in our view, Lucia offers a, a, a unique chance for the research community to work alongside uh, local, urban, regional policymakers and community groups. Um, it's about more than just studying or understanding challenges. It's about co-creating solutions. Uh, this is your chance. This is our chance to build upon existing networks, uh, or even create new ones working hand in hand with people on the ground to think about uh, how you can make that lasting impact uh, in these spaces. Now, in, in relation to this, uh, we do intend Lucia, uh, the pilot program, um, to, to think about ways in which it supports cross-government strategy and a, and a real mission-driven research space. Um, and we do expect strong arts and humanities methodologies and approaches uh, to be at the core uh, of proposed networks. Um, so I suppose just to sum up, um, why are we so excited about Lucia? Um, I think it's because it is transformational, right? It, it offers a chance for um, um, for us to change the way we approach knowledge creation. Um, it ensures that uh, knowledge creation is rooted in the lived experience uh, of the most affected by the issues that we study, while at the same time fostering a culture of co-created policy design. And I think this program gives us the opportunity to really rethink how research connects with real world communities, how it can empower people to take ownership of their own narratives. Um, and in this, we are looking for applicants who are ready to think differently. Um, we wanna work with researchers, with policymakers, with community groups um, who are eager to make a difference uh, and shift the way knowledge flows. So I suppose not just from institutions to communities, uh, but more from communities to the wider world. Um, it's it's through these partnerships that I think we'll see real innovation in how we understand and solve some of the most pressing social issues um, and build a research ecology that reflects uh, the needs and aspirations of everyone, not just a select few. Um, so as you consider joining us in this journey, and I hope 
you all will. Um, I encourage you to think about how your work could contribute to building a more inclusive and equitable future. Um, and as Emily and Lucy have, have already introduced, I'm really delighted that we've arranged for us to also hear from Professor Robert McIntosh, uh, his colleague Dong Lin, uh, from the EDNI caucus a bit later, as well as Mike Collins, our head of public engagement. And of course, you'll hear more from our cities and urban team uh, at AHRC. Um, so with that, uh, thank you for your interest in the Lucia program. Um, I can't wait to see how we can create real and meaningful change together. Um, Emily or Lucy, can I hand back to you? Absolutely. Thank you, Jaideep. I think James is now, if I can hand over to James, thank you. Um, James is now going to take us through our next couple of slides. So this is James Phillips from our Cities and Urban Environments team. Hi, everyone. Um, as Emily said, we're just going to go through some, some key information about the Lucia call. Um, so if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so just some overview information about timelines and, and sort of key information about the call. So through the Lucia programme, AHRC will fund up to five locally led pilot networks to enhance access to culture, co-create design of cultural policy and promote inclusion and integration of marginalised communities across the UK. The key objective of pilot networks will be to build equitable cross-sector partnerships together across communities, researchers and policymakers. Um, the full economic cost or FEC of each pilot network can be up to £100,000 and AHRC will fund 80% of the full economic costing. Uh, networks must start by the 1st of April 2026 and will be funded for 12 months. And as I'm sure you're all aware by now, Lucia Call is now live and will run until the 10th of April 2025. And full guidance can be found on the Lucia funding opportunity on the UK, UKRI funding finder, which Alice has very kindly put in the chat for us. Thank you, Alice. Um, I also just wanted to encourage anyone interested in applying uh, to complete a notification of intent um, before they do apply, which will be uh, the NOI stage will be open until the 3rd of December this year. Uh, next slide, please. And the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, the importance of equitable partnerships in the Lucia uh, funding opportunity. So listening to community voices, researchers and policymakers has been a key part um, of our preparation for this call and was part of scoping workshops we held in the spring. Um, so we recognise the continuing demand for equitable collaborative practice in this space. And some of the key recommendations from those workshops highlighted the importance of valuing people's time and creativity uh, that network timescales needed to build in time to listen, to test out, to explore an open-ended remit, um, and that there needs to be remuneration for everyone at the table, embedding in people with uh, expertise by experience and community groups at the conception of projects as genuinely equitable researchers, working in ways that may be different to the expectations of the research community involved, and as Jaideep mentioned, from the bottom up. Bottom up. Uh, we have responded to these recommendations in a variety of ways. So we've ensured the Lucia call is open for eight months, and we hope that applicants um, will have time and space to consider their applications and build meaningful, meaningful and inclusive cross-sector partnerships. We've placed particular emphasis on ensuring project co-leads from cultural and community partners, as well as people with expertise by experience, must be included as part of network leadership teams. Um, applications will need to demonstrate how equitable co-creation and community engagement is embedded in proposed pilot networks. Um, and we also understand um, equitable practices, of course, in a continuous and ongoing process. And we're committed to ensuring these principles are embedded throughout the Lucia programme. So people with expertise by experience will be invited to be a part of the Lucia assessment panel and will be asked to review all assessment criteria. And also, as, as Jaideep has mentioned, we're, we're excited to be working with Robert and Dong from the UKRI EDI caucus to continue embedding equality, diversity and inclusion learnings throughout uh, our processes, such as application, assessment 
and governance structures connected to Lucia programme. I now hand over to Emily to speak a little bit more about eligibility and other key information. James, thank you. Um, I want to go through a little bit of the eligibility sort of criteria. Um, it's not a it's it's not a complicated criteria for this program. Uh, we are adhering to our standard AHRC eligibility. But more widely, um, we're really looking for applications that are going to be led by a strong interdisciplinary team who can really articulate a clear shared vision for the network. Um, we would expect that at least one member of the leadership team is um, or has de demonstrable experience in research within the cities and urban environments area. And here, as Jaideep stressed earlier as well, we're really keen to... Um, to note the importance that, as we will see, of kind of proposed um, arts and humanities research methodologies and systems uh, within the, the program. So within the networks themselves, we're very keen that um, they are interdisciplinary, and yet we would like to see a really strong focus on uh, predominantly arts and humanities um, research methodologies within, within these networks. The project lead, uh, we'll be looking to have um, sort of standard eligibility criteria, which sort of, uh, which means generally they need to be resident within the UK, they need to be hosted by an eligible research organisation, um, and that's obviously higher educational, research, higher educational research institution or a recognised independent research organisation. Um, details of all of these are on our website, so by all means do, do go and have a quick look. Um, that will be for project leads and also project co-leads that are based within academic institutions. Um, our AHRC research funding guide, I think there'll probably be a, a link put into the chat here um, as well for that. That's definitely worth having a look here. But again, just to refer anybody to, um, to, to come back to us, if you've got any questions about eligibility, we're more than happy to look into very specific um, cases and, and say whether or not we would deem that to be eligible to make an application. We'd, we'd hate for somebody to put through the whole application together, um, only for that to be a, a real stumbling block at the end. Just to note that project co-leads from cultural or cultural policy, um, civic discourse or any other relevant sectors that may well be involved within the networks um, must be included as part of the, of the leadership team. So in terms of eligibility, we wouldn't see them as needing um, the same standard eligibility as uh, somebody who's based within a university, for example, um, but we would need to see them A, included in the leadership team and obviously B, um, remunerated equitably for their time. So where justified, the time of these project co-leads can be listed under the exceptions uh, costing policy and they can be funded at 100% for the economic cost. I'm going to take us through next slide, I think the top one, thank you very much, um, a little bit more of our sort of costing policy here. Um, again, it's not it's not terrifically complicated, but there are some complications around it. So um, most of the costs associated with the networks within the programme will be as standard charged at 80% of the full economic cost, which adheres to our normal AHRC and UKRI costing policy. However, as I mentioned, project co-leads who aren't based within a research organisation or perhaps who come from outside academia will be eligible to claim costs at 100% of the full economic cost of their time. And just to note there, that, that will be only for staff time and it wouldn't necessarily include um, estates costs and indirect costs. Um, but again, this, this can be quite confusing. So by all means, please uh, contact us with any sort of direct queries about this, about any individuals that you're proposing to be within a network. We'd be more than happy to answer any questions like that. Just to drive home the point as well that James has just mentioned, the notification of intent stage we're seeing as a really important stage for this program. Um, it's not mandatory, and that means that if you're watching this webinar in a few months time um, and have only come across the, the program in a few months time, please don't worry, it's not too late. Um, however, if you're watching it in real time now, um, we would really appreciate as many people putting in their notification of intent to apply um, by the deadline in December. Um, this is going to serve two purposes. Firstly, it's going to enable us to put together a really uh, strong assessment panel, um, which will cover all of the appropriate expertise within the research areas that are covered in the indicative applications. Um, to note there, we're quite aware as well that as relationships build and form um, the network, um, identities may change. That's not a problem. If it's if it's slightly different from if the if the full application is slightly different from your notification of intent to submit, that's not a problem at all. It's just an indication for us to be able to make sure that we're putting together the strongest assessment panel that we possibly can. 
Furthermore, though, it also enables us to flag any research proposals that might have really complementary elements, uh, and that will obviously help anybody out with uh, potential networking purposes, but also potential collaboration purposes. So that, that could be offered. Finally, I'd love to just flag that we're quite excited to announce um, we are currently building an additional Lucia Fellowship Award. Um, it's not totally confirmed yet, but we are hoping in January to launch a fellowship opportunity, which will um, be in, in collaboration with the local government association, the LGA. They, would, they are looking to host a fellow who would sit alongside the networks within the Lucia programme. They would be a Lucia Fellow. And the principal, um, principal role or, or aim of the fellowship will be in order to facilitate relationship building between individuals working within local and regional government um, and academics. We, 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 that's an, another reflection from our workshops where that would seem to be um, sometimes a challenge to some of these networks really taking off. So um, that fellowship is really exciting. We're building it at the moment. As I say, it's not fully confirmed as yet, but I wanted to announce today that that's, um, that's what we're working on and we're really excited about it. Um, so watch this space. Hopefully in January, that should be um, something that we're able to, to announce and launch. The time frame for that will, will go um, very similarly to the, the um, Lucia networks. So it will, it will close in April and will run concurrently uh, when it goes live with the Lucia networks. OK, great. I think if I may, I'm going to hand over to Mike Collins now. Uh, Mike's, as I say, our head of uh, public engagement. He's going to give us some public engagement expectations for the programme. Thanks very much, Emily and James. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, nice to see so many people on the call today. I suppose before I sort of started to talk a little bit about public engagement expectations, um, I suppose in terms of the research elements of these projects, um, just emphasising with the, the call being open for, for so long is, is really um, drawing on any sort of public engagement or community engagement expertise you might have at institutions. Public engagement professionals are very keen to be able to support in applications and can help facilitate in terms of engagement activities. So that will be one thing. Um, we're also hoping to run a um, webinar early in the new year with the National Coordinating Centre for Public Engagement, where we'll explore some of the reflections that the team at NCCP have in terms of what works and best practice and top tips. So please do keep an eye on um, the funding call page for information about that webinar, hopefully in the sort of mid, mid to late January. Um, and I think I suppose in terms of building on what Jaideep, Emily and, and James have already said, I think it's really the exciting thing about this, this call and this network is around the, the voices and experiences of people that are seldom heard in discussions around culture and the arts. So that's the really exciting thing has been able to, to work with a, the, the team leading on the design of this call to ensure that public engagement and engaging communities. And I know communities are fluid and broad and will include people and organisations of lots of different kinds. Um, so that's something that is really exciting about seeing the, the sort of prominent role of, of engaging communities in, in the networks and really having that sort of rich conversation, that process of knowledge exchange between the public communities, researchers and other organisations within those communities that can then really sort of design some exciting um, ideas for how you can use culture to tackle um, inequalities. Um, I think that sort of focus around co-production and, co and collaboration is, is really important, how you can um, engage those communities in, in terms of the development of the networks and, and the role that they, they will play. Um, and I think that's sort of really exciting in terms of how you can um, you know, engage communities in really rich and imaginative ways and that's the, the brilliant thing about the arts humanities is the sort of innovation and best practice that that the sector has um, but I think yeah definitely in terms of focusing and around the sort of early conversations with potential partners and, and drawing on those professional support networks that you might have at institutions and of course if your organizations that are wanting to be part and, and partner up with with universities you know having those really early conversations so that Public engagement professionals can help in the crafting and design either of the statement of intent um, or the full application and, and sort of building them into to the teams as you're developing the ideas. I'm now going to hand over to Professor Robert McIntosh and Dr. Um, Don Lin from our EDI caucus just to talk a little bit more um, about the, the call. Thanks, Mike. 
Uh, and it's a delight to be here this afternoon. My name is Robert McIntosh. I'm based at the University of the West of Scotland. And my colleague, Dong Ling, who's on the call, is one of the postdocs on the project, and she's based at Harriet Watt. So I'll just tell you a little bit about the EDI caucus, if you haven't come across it before. It's a UKRI-funded project, and AHRC is one of the funding partners in that consortium. Um, and it's looking at making research and innovation spaces and careers more inclusive and more diverse than they currently are. Uh, it's organised into three work streams, and the work stream that Dong and I are working on is work stream two, and it's got a particular focus on the way in which peer review processes for funding and for publication seem to systemically disadvantage some communities. So why some underrepresented communities don't tend to receive funding and don't tend to manage to publish in, uh, in the most competitive of outlets uh, as effectively as each other. Um, we've done some work already and we've produced an evidence review and that evidence review is available on the EDI caucus website and I'll stick a link to that into the chat in, in a moment. Um, and the evidence review tells us there's some things, particularly like a good example would be gender, where there's quite a lot known about the disparities in funding outcomes and publication outcomes when looked through a, through a gender lens. And there's actually quite a lot of work that's been done of introducing um, policies or practices to try and address those systemic disadvantages. Um, and some of those have been evaluated. But there are other areas where much less work has been done, and that's what the caucus is, is trying to tackle. So why are we involved in the Lucia uh, project and, and why are we involved at this very early stage? Well, first of all, because AHRC is one of our funding partners and it's, uh, it's great to be working empirically. We're doing research on how one does research, I suppose. But secondly, because Lucia itself is a really excellent example, in my view, of a much broader definition of the community of people who do research, who are involved. So it's not just academics in universities, but it's community partners of a variety of shapes and sizes in the public and private sector and third sector. And so what we're looking to do as part of this process is to work with the team leading the call at each stage from this very early exploratory expressions of interest stage through to the development of bids and eventually their evaluation by a panel. And so we've been using diary studies as the mechanism for doing that elsewhere in the caucus. And that will mean that when panelists come to evaluate the proposals that eventually come through at the, at the end of this process, we'd be asking them to do that work, but also to share with us a, a short video diary before they start that and after they've finished it to catch their sense in which inclusivity and diversity are genuinely part of the evaluation process and how easy or difficult they have found that to, uh, to enact in their decision making. And we're doing that partly to help this project, but partly to learn lessons about how one commissions and funds projects that would eventually deliver that more inclusive and more sustainable set of uh, diverse experiences in research and innovation settings. Uh, I'll stick a link to the EDI caucus uh, website into the chat in a moment. You'll find on there details of the evidence review, but also of a seminar series and a whole set of things that the wider caucus is doing. And if any of you are interested in that, please feel free to reach out to either Dong or myself, and I'd be very happy to uh, to follow up. But thank you very much for this short advertorial part of the process and to at least explain what the caucus will be doing in the background whilst the Lucia process rolls forward. Thank you. All right, and now we've come to the question and answer session of the webinar. Uh, once again, thank you to everybody who submitted a question in advance, and we're going to prioritize getting through those within the time remaining. Any other questions, and especially those that have come through the chat today, we're going to also answer and make sure that these are available alongside the webinar recording in a Q&A document. So the first question that we have today, I'm going to ask James if he could answer it. And this is, is this funding opportunity concentrated on local communities in urban areas or in cities only? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucy, and thank you um, for that question. I think we have a broad definition of, of uh, urban in the cities and urban portfolio at HRC. So that includes, um, it can include cities and towns. It can include the relationship between the urban and the rural, um, between semi, uh, between suburban and peri-urban areas. But I think the crucial part of how we define urban as well is we expect to see a clear focus on community. Um, and we want to avoid, especially with Lucia, to, um, to be prescriptive in determining the types of activities um, that networks will 
will focus on all the places and communities that they they may be a part of um, collaborating with. So I think if, for example, um, a project looks at involving coastal communities, for example, or the relationship between urban and rural um, communities, that would still fall within the Lucia program scope and would be assessed um, alongside all other applications by our assessment panel. Great, thank you. The next question I have, I'm gonna ask if Emily could answer this, and that is, is there scope to build on existing networks of cultural practitioners? Alternatively, can a new network formed after this webinar be qualified for the funding or must it be an existing one? Yeah, thank you, Lucy. That's a really good question. Um, I think, to be honest, through Lucia, we really want to encourage pilots that are both uh, continuations of pre-existing cross-sector partnerships and also newly formed uh, networks. So we've obviously deliberately designed the call to run um, until the 10th of April. Um, and that's chiefly to ensure that applicants have both the time and also the collaboration space to really explore new partnerships and to build on those relationships that are already in place between researchers, communities, and local and regional devolved government. So yeah, that being said, any pre-existing networks uh, would certainly not be excluded. We would simply need to see perhaps new activity uh, coming out um, and sort of additionality, I guess, um, through the Lucia program. Great, thank you. And I'll get you to take the next question as well. And that is, can the proposed research network come from an existing network of organizations not currently focused on research? Yeah, that's a good question. So we would expect to see um, at least one membership of the one member, sorry, of the leadership team um, holding experience in research within the cities and urban uh, environments area. And obviously, for administrative purposes, it would also be necessary to identify a single project lead um, who's going to have to be affiliated with a lead research organisation. Um, that project lead and the RO, the research organisation, will ultimately have to be responsible for. The administration not just of the application but the the management of the grant as well um, however that being said um, the balance of activity and management across the leadership team of these networks um, and the partner organizations that are going to be involved can be shared totally flexibly um, and however you know you see fit as a collective um, the project leads the project co-leads i should say from cultural cultural policy um, civic discourse um, areas um, among other obviously very relevant sectors, um, as well as people with expertise by experience will need to be included as part of the leadership team. However, that's a real stringent uh, must for us within the project. All right, thank you. And Tom, I've got a question for you here. How large do you imagine the team of community practitioners, researchers and policymakers will be? Thanks, Lucy. So currently there's no limit to the, the size of the leadership team um, and the, the project co-leads involved. So it's really up to applicants to consider, first of all, the suitability and um, really the economic feasibility of project leadership teams. Um, what we're really looking to foster here is inclusive and equitable um, uh, ways of working between project partners. Um, just to, to follow up on that as well, um, any project co-leads not based at eligible organisations or for international project co-leads, um, the combined costs uh, for these staff members cannot exceed 30% of the full economic cost. So that's also worth considering when building your project team. Great, thank you. Just to say, we, we can see that there's more questions coming in and to reassure everybody, we will answer these in the Q&A document that will be available alongside the, the webinar recording. So Mike, I've got a question for you here. As an HEI, is it better to apply as a consortium bid alongside other partners or apply as a sole institution? Thanks, Lucy. Um, so um, for administrative purposes, it's necessary to identify a single project lead um, who must be affiliated with the lead research organization. Um, the project lead and, and their research office will be ultimately responsible for the administration of the grant if awarded. Um, but just to add that sort of however there's a balance of activities and management across that leadership team or the leadership team and partner organizations um, can be shared flexibly um, and as however as you sort of see fit as a, as a collective of um, partners. All right, thank you. 
James, here's one for you. How would access to healthcare be within remit? For example, health policy, overcoming health inequalities, et cetera? Yeah, again, great question. Um, I think the, the core focus of, of Lucia is on co-creating cultural policy design and, and widening cultural access as has already been discussed. But we also really understand the significance of, of creativity and the arts in the health sector. Um, for example, HRC's Mobilising Community Assets Programme is a great example of that. Um, so if your proposed network is able to tackle both themes, so both in terms of um, cultural access and policy design, but also looking at health policy, for example, then I think this, this would also be in scope in terms of the Lucia programme as well. All right, thank you. And I've got another one for you. To what degree is place and or regional scope a criteria? Okay, um, so we we encourage applicants to think collaborative, collaboratively sorry, um, about the partnerships for each Lucia network pilot. Um, and this can definitely include thinking across different communities, places and regions. Um, so we'd expect to see justification around location choice and for applicants to really carefully think about the feasibility of working within a place or region. Um, that's specified, but I think it's also, also I think, about um, you can think across different communities, places and regions. So, yes, um, absolutely, it's an important part of the Lugia program. Great, thank you. So I've got another question here. What are the expected or hoped for outcomes of the scheme? What would funded products projects be expected to produce? And Emily, do you want to take that one? Absolutely. Thank you. It's a good question. Um, I guess the core intention for the Lutia, Lutia pilots is to build, um, obviously, equitable urban partnerships as part um, of the networks, primarily. However, we also expect to see some really meaningful activity around community co-design and cultural policy design and the development of innovative research methodologies uh, based within the arts and humanities to really enhance cultural access. Um, it's worth bearing in mind that, obviously, this program sits um, it's a pilot for a much broader strategic area and it sits within um, a, a, a very um, a very busy space I guess so the HRC is very well placed here with other investments including our creative communities program our place program um, our mobilizing community assets program I know James just mentioned that one um, which have already got significant outputs so we're really looking for some additionality of outcomes um, and how your network would really add value in this, as I say, very well-established area. Um, we'd like to primarily to see cultural policy design, but with a really great emphasis on actively standing collaborations to, I guess, to drive the strategic agenda forward here. Um, Lucia is, is a forward, really forward-looking programme. We really hope to see some, um, some really meaningful um, outputs from it. So yeah, great question, thank you. Thank you. And Mike, I've got a question for you here. Would it be acceptable for a significant portion of the funding to be set aside for community groups, self and for community groups and self-identified activities? I think you might be on mute. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think it goes back to some of the sort of um, important points raised at the start of the, the webinar about the, the fundamental um, importance of equitable partnerships. And I think we definitely would expect to see activities specified in the application form in order for our assessment panel to understand how network activities will be broken down and costed. Um, and obviously these the activities can be led by pro project, project co-leads outside academia and would need to adhere to the standards of equitable partnerships that we would expect within this program so that you're enabling people and communities to fully participate in the network. So that's something that's really important, be a really good question in terms of how important equitable partnerships are and supporting community activities. Great, thank you. Tom, I've got another question for you. Will Lucia affect AHRC's catalyst scheme eligibility? Uh, thanks, Lucy. So. Uh, an application to the Lucia program will not affect your eligibility to other responsive mode schemes. Um, 
I would just be mindful that um, other schemes may have a different scope or even application requirements, um, all of which will be available on the UKMI funding finder um, for the page for, for the uh, scheme in question. Um, additionally, if applicants are um, applying to, to multiple schemes, um, to also be mindful of any time commitments uh, in the event that uh, multiple um, applications are funded. Thank you. James, here's one for you. Will AHRC actively manage the geographical spread of the awards? Thanks, Lucy. Um, just so Lucia is intended to offer coordinated UK wide investment um, with a spread of of collaborative networks funded across, as I just mentioned, locations, um, but also disciplines, community groups, and diverse approaches to research. So we would like to obviously see a spread of networks across the UK, but ultimately um, the assessment panel will be empowered to recommend the strongest overall uh, portfolio of proposals that they determine will provide the greatest added value. Um, and a sub panel may be convened to consider the applications deemed fundable by the assessment panel um, and may decide on the final portfolio of applications to be funded. Um, but HRC will, will make the, the final funding decision and reserves the right to modify the assessment process as needed. Um, so we, we have included some of this guidance as well in the funding finder opportunity too. As well. Great, thank you. Mike, here's another one for you. Are there any limits on the number of applications per research organization? Is there any priority or preference placed on projects or networks concentrating on communities local to the lead organization? Thank you. Um, so just to confirm, universities are permitted to submit more than one application as project lead for the Lucia call. Similarly, if you're a cultural organization or community partner, who would like to be a project co-league lead, you are able to be part of more than one leadership team. There are no scheme-specific caps on the number of applications which any one research organisation can support for this opportunity. Um, however, there needs to be a local and or regional focus to the pilot networks, and we also encourage project leads to consider connections and civic university agreements with their research institutions. Great, thank you. So we've got another question here, reference to point six under what we will fund on the um, UKRF funding finder. Could you expand on what you're looking for in terms of scalability of the networks? Is there a further scheme planned beyond the five-year pilot projects? So Emily, I'll, I'll pass over to you for that one. Sure, thank you, that's a good question. Um, I think primarily we would expect plans to have the potential to scale up. Um, from a pilot network to something uh, perhaps larger in the future with the hope that our UKRI funding can be amplified in future. Um, and obviously we really hope to be in a position in future to offer further funding for a wider perhaps network plus uh, model programme. Um, however, we obviously can't guarantee that um, there will be any further funding in this space. And we wouldn't therefore expect to see um, a, we would therefore, I guess, expect to see um, a justification from all the applications that the success of their network outcomes um, isn't dependent on further funding. So it's a bit of a yes, but no, but unfortunately answer that one. Uh, we would really hope that, um, that we have the opportunity to offer scale up opportunities for these networks in future. Um, however, they would need to stand alone, I think, in terms of their outputs and sustainability if there is no further future funding. I hope that's clear. I'm sorry, that's a strange yeah. answer. Thank you, Emily. All right, and for Tom, can you ex can you explain the process for making an application and the criteria for external partners? Oh, sorry, yeah, no problem. Um, just before I, I jump into that, Lucy, um, I've received a response from uh, Rachel in the chat um, surrounding the previous point around the Catalyst Award. Um, it's a really, really good question. Um, so I will, I'll take that away and definitely get back to you with an answer. I think this, this really, um, comes down to the, the definition of, of a large funding award. Um, so we'll, we'll get back to you, um, on that point. 
Um, to answer your question, Lucy, around the, the process for making an application. Um, so I think as Mike um, actually mentions um, earlier on, the, the project lead should be responsible for completing the application process on the funding service. And this is mainly for um, administrative purposes. Now, we expect that all team members um, within the project um, including project partners, um, should contribute to the application. So once the application has actually been started by the project lead on the funding by, on the, um, the funding service, um, collaborators can be added to the application to contribute to the draft. Um, but um, it's just worth noting that uh, project teams should look to coordinate when updates are going to be made. Um, or, or even to work offline on the draft, just to avoid any timeout issues or duplications of work. Um, there is full guidance on the application process uh, within the, the how to apply section of the funding finder page. Um, if you do still have any questions though, um, prior to application or, or prior to, to the closing date for the opportunity, um, please drop a line to the Health, Environmental and Urban Humanities inbox, which is also within the Funding Finder page. Great. Thanks, Tom. I've actually got two more for you. So the first one is, uh, what happens if the project lead is an ECR currently on a temporary contract? For example, they're currently on a BA postdoc scheme that ends in September 2026. Would they be able to begin Lucia in April 2026 and continue at the university as the project lead from September 2026 onwards? So initially, um, I don't see any issues with that. So our current stance at the moment is that um, we would just require uh, any arrangements to be in place at the point of, of submission of the application. Um, but I think closer to the time of application, um, it may just be uh, double checking that with, with some more uh, details. Um, if you want to get in touch with the team. Great, thank you. And for the last question, it's, it's for you as well. For exception costs for non-HEI partners, can these include other directly incurred costs too? So the um, it's, it's an excellent question. I, I can see that the, the the actual guidance within within the funding finder page suggests uh, staff time um, costs can be costed 100% of the full economic cost for any um, non-HEI partners. Now, typically for any costs um, at 100%, these would exclude... Um, so... Uh, Apologies. These would exclude infrastructure costs, so estates or indirect costs, um, but essentially any costs associ associated with supporting the non-HEI or international co-lead um, in actually conducting the research would be eligible to be claimed at 100%. Um, but again, if anyone does need any further clarification on that, that will be included in the FAQ. Great, thank you. And thank you once again to everybody who pre-submitted questions. We tried our best to answer them as best as we could today. Everything that was said today, including everything that's been asked on the chat that we haven't been able to get to will be included in a more comprehensive more comprehensive Q&A document that will sit alongside this webinar recording. And I'm gonna now pass on to Emily to close the webinar with some final remarks. Thank you, Lucy, that's great. And thank you for the questions there. Um, and thank you to everybody who's who's here and has been um, has been with us for this last 50 minutes or so. It looks like we're going to be wrapping up early, so we can perhaps all take back some time, which is good. Um, but just a couple of reminders before we go. Um, the recording is going to be uploaded to the HRI Funding Finder website, um, as will the webinar materials. So I think there was a quick question in there around these slides. Um, they will absolutely be um, sent across as well. Um, and obviously the frequently asked questions document that we're we're compiling at the moment. Um, and we'll be adding to once we can get all of the, the chat questions from today as well. Um,
But just to urge you, really, if you have any further questions or any specific questions about an application that you're thinking of putting together, um, by all means, drop us an email with any specific sort of uh, niche queries that we can really help with. Um, and we'll be able to, to um, hopefully give you some really strong guidance on, on that. Um, Otherwise, uh, I wanted to say, um, I've just seen another question in the chat. We're not going to be, as Lucy said, we're not going to be looking to answer any of the other questions in the chat, just because I think it's perhaps not fair to be cherry picking certain questions. Um, but again, thank you. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you for your interest in the programme. Um, and thank you to all of the people who have presented today um, to, to provide a bit more information around this. Um, any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Otherwise, I think it's time for us to, to close the, the webinar. Thanks again all. Bye-bye.